Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Campbell, and I'm the Senior Beef and Sheep Technologist here at CAFRI. You're very welcome to the first of four planned Northern Ireland Sheep Programme WebEx events. It was our plan to run a series of these events uh, on the participating Northern Ireland Sheep Programme farms throughout this year, but sadly, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this just can't happen at present. In the event of technology letting us down tonight, please note this event will be recorded and we aim to send the, a link to the recording uh, to each of you within the next few weeks. Please note that throughout tonight's event, you may experience connectivity problems from time to time due to your broadband speed. Uh, don't worry about it, you'll, you'll soon get in again. Uh, you will have the opportunity throughout the event to submit questions. Laptop users can submit questions using the Q&A icon uh, at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are using mobile phones, you can access a Q&A option via the three dot icon, which will appear once you tap your mobile screen. We will answer a number of these questions towards the end of the event. In addition to this, we do we would like your feedback and a short survey will appear at the end of the event. I will provide you with further details uh, towards the end. Tonight, I would like to welcome our three panel speakers uh, as follows. Firstly, we have Senan White. Senan is, uh, is a McCaffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor uh, and is also the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme Manager. We have also Darren Carty. Uh, Darren is, the, uh, livestock space, is a livestock specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal. And finally, we have Porrick McNeil. Porrick is one of the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme participants. You're all very welcome. In addition to this, uh, you'll see two other names. We have Ronan and Pamela, uh, who, are also, who are here to provide us with IT support uh, throughout. Tonight's event is going to provide a background to the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme, and we'll introduce the 10 participating farms. Porrick McNeil from Anna Clone will then provide us with a background to the sheep enterprise. He has his own sheep enterprise and will talk us through grassland management on his farm, and will introduce us to some of the changes he has made since joining the programme over the last year. Darren is also available to answer questions in relation to the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme as one of the, the project partners. So at this stage, I'm now going to hand over to Senan and Porrick and uh, sit back and again, keep feeding three questions and we will try and answer as many of these as we can towards the end. Thank you. Okay, Graham. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody, and hope you're all well this evening. As Graham has said, uh, my name is uh, Sam White. I'm uh, one of the Beef and Sheep Advisors here at CAFRI and in my current role, I'm the Programme Manager for the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme. So folks, what's going to happen this evening? I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction to the programme, a bit of a background. Then um, we're going to have a video from the uh, industry partners, um, short video on that there, so I'll be switching over to that there. Then uh, we've got uh, some of the aims and objectives of the programme. I'll say this is our first um, first opportunity to, to get this out uh, via this way. And then we will be introducing Porig, um, Porig McNeil uh, and the things that he's done on his farm. So that's the, the plan for this evening. And I'll say hopefully technology goes with us to that there. So here we go. So basically we've been about the program itself. Uh, it is a collaborative partnership uh, between uh, Dunbia, which is part of the Dawn's Meat Group, uh, the Irish Farmers Journal and ourselves at CAFRI, the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. So if you are following uh, the programme in the journal, and it's also on the websites as well, so um, it is um, fairly well publicised. Uh, we were launched uh, last year, and uh, so this is a series of events to uh, further uh, showcase the programme. So basically what I'm going to do now, folks, is give a short video uh, from the three uh, represents from the three uh, partners. Hello, I'm Mark McKendry, uh, the CAFRI Director. I would just like to say how proud we are at CAFRI uh, to be working in partnership on the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme with Dumbia and the Irish Farmers Journal. Um, the absolute key success to this programme is really where the advisor, uh, in this case Senan, uh, works in partnership with our, our 10 participant farmers. Um, and really there are two stages to the programme, one where we develop the, the 10 businesses, um, which is vitally important, but also a really uh, another important aspect is that we can share that knowledge and best practice with the wider sheep industry. 
and tonight is one of those such events uh, and I wish the event tonight and the future uh, success for the programme. Thank you. Good evening all, my name is Darren Carty from the Irish Farmers Journal. With ongoing worries around Brexit, coronavirus and now reports of negative trade talks, it has never been more important than to maximise efficiency within the farm gate. The Northern Ireland Sheep Programme is an excellent platform to do this and we hope that you can take something from this evening's farm walk or from the weekly articles and updates in print and online to help improve your system. Greetings, Tim Dobson, Chairman of Dumbia here. I hope this time you and your family are safe and well in these changed and challenging times. Dumbia is really proud to be associated with the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme. COVID-19 has been difficult for our group and indeed industry everywhere. This has resulted in the cancellation of our planned farm events. However, I am very encouraged at the resourcefulness of our farmers to learn that our Northern Ireland sheep members are regularly communicating with each other through various media channels. In particular, WhatsApp. I understand the WhatsApp group have been very successful in this role. On a more positive note, it's great to learn that those lambs from the programme's farmers are starting to come through and are of a very high quality, meeting what the market requires. This is a true reflection of the skillful management from the programme's members. I am also encouraged to hear that the EID feedback to the farmers on the individual carcasses is working well. We will work to ensure that this continues to help Northern Ireland farmers make good management decisions going forward. Finally, I just want to wish you all the success in the upcoming year. Thank you. Thanks very much then to uh, Martin, uh, Darren and Jim for uh, those words. Um, Safe. So we would like to have been this on the farm at Porrigs in this case, but uh, circumstances have dictated otherwise. So. So the next bit, just to go to a brief overview of the overall objective of the programme. Uh, it's a three-year programme. Um, we were launched last year. Um, basic, simple objectives is to deliver more money into farmers' pockets. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to look at two main areas. Um, basically, adopting best practice techniques, best management practice techniques that we'll be discussing uh, later on and over the series of events, and also the latest technologies available, so demonstrating them on farm. And so those are the two main ways that we're going to uh, deliver the objectives of the program. So these are the farmers uh, involved. And we'll also hear a few represent representatives of uh, Dunbia. Uh, this was at a very successful uh, walk at the Dunbia plant uh, last August. So we have a range of farmers here. Uh, just to show you a wee map here, uh, they're, every county is represented. Um, we have from uh, Antrim, uh, North West, Tyrone, Fermanagh, Armagh, and the seed in my own county, uh, County Down, uh, with Parig as well. So uh, we have a good good spread over the over the over the area. Uh, and with that as well, we have probably half and half uh, upland and lowland farmers. So here's uh, just a few pictures of the farmers that you may have seen in the in the journal and on the website. We have uh, Clement Lynch here, uh, Dermot McCullough and uh, Darren McAleese, who would be farming in the uplands. Uh, then we have brothers Peter and Karen McCaughan, uh, Bally Castle, uh, James McKay from uh, Drumquin and Tyrone, also farming in the uplands. Then we have uh, Mark Davison, who will be uh, featured in their next WebEx next week, um, from, uh, I'd say, Dungannon. Then we have the, our farmer this evening, Porig, uh, from Anna Clone. Uh, then we have Trevor Nixon here on the right from uh, County Fermanagh, Valmalek. And the final two here, we have uh, Marlon and Roy Mears from Tampo in County Fermanagh, and then Kate Kingham and uh, Peter Mount from Tain and Abbey, uh, Tain and County Armagh. So those are our farmers uh, from them. They're all very welcome here, and it's uh, been a pleasure to work with them over the last uh, year or so. So basically, what, what's the programme about? What are we focusing on? Um, well, the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme, NISP for short there, we have eight main aims uh, drawn up at the start of the program between the, the, the team. Um, farm sustainability, uh, farm finance and profitability, uh, flock health optimization, soil fertility, uh, breeding performance through grazing management, which we'll be talking about this evening, uh, genetic improvement and breeding profitable sheep, 
marketing prowess and farm safety. Um, every one of those is are important in their own right. Um, and there are benchmarks against each one of those and each farmer will have targets uh, within that. Some uh, more important than others uh, for each farmer, some more urgent than others. So um, we say we will, we will be seeing that as we, as we go along through the programme. And it will be highlighted at different stages. Um, but to break it down to a, a more basic level, uh, when I started in the role, um, I sat down with each farm business and they said, look, what are your short, medium and long term goals? And that's what I encourage any farmer to do, to have some sort of plan, some sort of things that need, you, want, you want to move towards. So with the theme of grazing tonight, um, an example here we'll have for short term goals, one to two years, basically laming all the farm. Doesn't have to be anything too complicated. It can be complex. It can be simple. So, you know, the simple things can sometimes deliver the best results. Um, so that's in one case here, one or two years laying all the farm. Another example then would be maybe a bit longer, get increased grass growth. So that's, you know, as you see here, plate meter measuring grass and assess how it's doing. And then the, third, the final one here, five years plus, you know, potential goal is to have all or half your farm uh, reseeded. So Parik and all the other uh, farmers in the programme have individual goals as well, individual farm goals. But all I would say is it's important that every farm has some uh, gold set up. Um, otherwise, you know, you're just doing things for the sake of doing things. So I would encourage any farm to have that uh, done. Um, what we're going to call it this evening is one of those, uh, one of the eight main aims is driving performance through grazing management. And the, big, the one thing I just want to draw your attention to on the slide is the top line or the, the bold line there. Growth ranges from three tonne to the hectare to 10 to 12 tonne to the hectare across farms. So there's a vast range and that is one of the uh, most important aspects that we can see where the biggest change can be made on farms, especially, you know, to the production is increased in that area. Grass is king, the term is used. So um, that's really where we're focusing um, on a lot is basically improved grass management. So what you need to do with all these uh, benchmarks is find out where you are at the minute. So that is what the, the programme farmers have done. Uh, we are encouraging to find out what is your grass level in the minute. Um, but how do you do that? So uh, all the programme farmers have received, and we'll talk about it later, uh, plate meters, and they're also into a grass measuring system as well. So that's where the vital point we have to start off with. Then we're looking at possible longer term things, reseeding infrastructure, those type of things. But that's where you want to start off with. Where are you at the moment? Overall, we want to aim to improve grass growth or vegetative growth, depending on what area we're talking about, by about 10 to 20 percent as a result of which you should be able to support uh, more stock on your farm. Uh, in the uplands, obviously, there's less green ground, so possibly we want to make sure that the, the land that has been grazed is kept in a good vegetative state, and obviously that's going to safeguard um, any land payments that you're receiving. So um, there's something there for everyone. So just a wee pictorial here that I'm sure maybe you have seen. Um, you know, you have the saying, I'll oh, have sheep of no grass, you know, that doesn't wash, doesn't wash anymore. So it's down to management. Um, as you see, there's only a fence dividing those two farms there. One's happy, one's not too happy. So as I say, it's down to management and using some of the technologies and um, management practices that we'll, Parig will be chatting about uh, shortly uh, to get to that level. So just, to, we're going to be talking about grazing system. I'll just go briefly go through here. The four main grazing systems that were that are, will be in Northern Ireland farms. Um, you have your set stocked, which I'm sure most people are, are aware of. Your animals are in the field, they're in for X amount of weeks, months, whatever. As soon as it's done, they're out. Um, the next one you would have on possibly a strip grazing where a bit more management's involved. Uh, you're moving your animals uh, along a line. See here the bottom left. Then we move on to rotational grazing, which is the next step up where you have possibly smaller fields and you're moving the sheep or the stock uh, a bit more regularly. And then finally, what we're mainly focusing on here tonight is paddock systems, whereby you're, you're splitting the fields into smaller fields, so to speak. So that's really what we'll be talking about and uh, Parik will be talking about later on. So folks, finally, the last wee bit here, and then we'll get on chatting to the main man. Um, I'll say I'm making no apologies for showing this again. Uh, the top line as I say, there's a vast uh, range of uh, grass growths uh, on farms, and all I'm saying is there's a massive potential to grow more grass on farms. And you know, 
you need to know where you're at. Uh, you need to know, have we got enough on the farm? And basically, how do you assess it? So that's basically what we're going to be covering here tonight. So, folks, that's enough of uh, my introduction for now. And uh, so we're going to bring on the, the our farmer for the scene in Parig. So hopefully he's about. Well, Simon. Well, Parig, how's you going? Not too bad. Good man, good man. Right, Parig, first of all, thanks very much for a... Uh, um, being our first farmer here in this in the program to uh, step up and uh, introduce yourself and the farm, so I uh, appreciate that. So, Parik, they've heard enough of me. Uh, maybe you tell us a bit about who all we're seeing here and uh, a bit about the farm. Um, I'll say as Parik is talking, folks, I'll be flicking through things. Um, so we'll just we'll just keep on moving. So, Parik, where you go? Hey, good evening, folks. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I suppose start off that picture there. It's a family-based farm, as most farms are in Ireland. So. You have uh, Daddy there to the left, two good women in the middle there, Mommy and the wife Amy, and then uh, hopefully the next generation farm on the right-hand side in Potty. So as I say there, farm partnership with Daddy, uh, Seamus here, um, on about 36 hectares of lowland farm. Um, we both work off-farm. I work off-farm full-time. Daddy work off-farm uh, part-time throughout the year. We run about 200 ewes and, and 50 ewe lambs, capital replacements. And a small suckler herd, about 18 and uh, 20 things, 20 uh, cows. Um, <clears throat> so I would say my name is it on this program, but um, Daddy's still heavily, heavily involved and I'll still be boss there. So all decisions are made together and to, to get the best out of both worlds. So traditionally, our nucleus flock would be that sort of Suffolk Cross Taxel um, and bred back to either Suffolk Cross Taxel, Taxel Ram. Yeah, I was just seeing here, Park, uh, the video playing here, some of your yews and lambs and your, your uh, electric fence up in the background. So this would be what you were talking about now, Park, or has this changed a wee bit? Or? No, that sort of video was taken slightly earlier in the year, and that would have been slightly earlier lambs. So as you see running through there, that would be your nucleus of your flock there. Um, stuff across taxal yews, um, and then that went back on to three rams in that group there. And um, it was Suffolk rams, taxal rams, and sprinkled bell tax rams as well. Just more or less a four acre field there, split in half into two acre paddocks. So it's a more recent one here. You'll probably see the new nucleus of the way we're going to move forward here. And um, whenever we brought new, brought new bloodlines into the farm. So there's Belclare ram across with this batch here. You'll see the Belclare lambs in there. And then there's Clin Yews and um, Daughters of Taxel Cross Mule Yews as well. So hopefully that's moving forward. That's for the sort of the U type we want to head down, slightly smaller U, but more prolific than what we had at the moment. Okay, good man. Uh, with all these things, Porig, like, you know, we'll be showing some of this stuff again, but um, with any, everyone in the program, you know, there is targets, there is things that every farm should have, and, 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 with this, and within this program, there's, there's no difference. So, uh, Porig, these are some of the things uh, with yourselves, and say these are only some of the program uh, targets for your, for your farm. Um, what, maybe you could just chat us through some of these, Park. Yeah, well, the gross margin target, we've probably looked at Daddy's and Benchmark in probably for 12 years now. It's always a figure we sort of keep a, a great eye on, as, as most people would. Um, so it's dipped slightly in this last couple of years, sitting in around like four, 502 there at the moment. So for the next four to five years, we're likely to get up closer to that 800 uh, pound per hectare. Target of weaning rate, uh, 1.75, I'd say, Probably was our own fault there, keeping more of a better looking new lamb, as you would say, than, than a most prolific one. So, our scanning rate and winning rate has dropped slightly over this last four to five years. So, we'd like to get it back up probably where it should be. All in all, then, if we can more or less look more at the grass growth, rejuvenation of swords, the last bit of the jigsaw then should be to increase the yield numbers. So, sitting around 200 at the moment. So we like to get over the 300 mark in the five years. Then the main part that sort of slipped probably over this last couple of years are would be with more more lambs left at the back end of the year. But we're on course there this year at the moment to have 75 80 percent drafted by, by October to leave more grass and more of a wedge built up for next year if they're using lambs going out. Excellent, very good folks. And I just have to say applaud party and anybody, you know, you're putting figures up there. Some people say oh, I don't want people to know, you know. These are what's there. These are targets. Porig's put it out there, and I know he's determined and has the ability to to do that. Um, and what I will say, targets are targets. Um, but the bottom line is the production. 
needs to be right. I uh, want to get the production growing right and say get the grass growing right and I say other things will follow in as well. So production is vital um, and I say they both, they both go hand in hand. So I think we've maybe covered some of this part, but maybe just a couple of the Belclair Ram you purchased there, you're talking about the Belclair in the flock. Yeah, we're a close flock for 20, 25 years. Um, it's the last three to four years, um, we looked at maybe trying to jump that prolificity a bit better. So introduction of clean and mule use um, to increase that lizard size. Ideally, this year should be our last year if we need to maybe buy a couple more in, but I'd rather get back to a close flock as soon as possible for health reasons and, and especially with the recording we know what we'll have. Um, yo lambs, half the yo lambs are tipped every year. We used to tip them to the Charlie, but we've changed this last couple of years to the bell tax. Um, and then down the more the maternal route, purchased a maternal bell clear ram lamb um, last year. So very happy with how it's going so far. Um, lamb in two batches there. Housing would be limited around here. Um, so we have more of a split into two batches. Teaser runs for a fortnight, then you'll just split in half into the ram, then a, a week's break, and then the next batch is in, obviously, you'll lambs follow. So, more or less, has to give us a bit of time, a bit of lambing time, and that week in between there should be give us time to clear out houses and you know, keep disease to minimum. Um, th- thankfully, to the teaser, 85% of them use lambed in the first nine to ten days of their both batches. Uh, so the teaser party, is that a new thing or have you had it a wee while? Or? This will be our second year coming in now to use the teaser. Um, we've looked at it before, back and forward and talked about it, but took the jump last year and it's definitely, even going through the live week game there on lambs, you have more of a sort of confirmed batch of lambs coming together, easier drafted, so definitely if it, I, would, I would encourage everybody to look down that route if it suited them. Very good, very good. And just just to go over the last point there, like we met, you know, a while ago, Parig, and like you were talking about the housing, you know, it's a lot of money and that maybe was a long term goal, you know, maybe with things change and maybe or maybe not, that's still on the agenda. Yeah, the housing is upgraded, um, definitely does, but probably going inside with the, maybe increasing the yield numbers, I'd like to get grassland back to where it was, more increasing paddock, so probably the final part of the jigsaw. Very good. As I say, that's what I say, folks. The, the goals can change as you go along, and uh, that's that's uh, quite acceptable. So basically, part again, the you've all we've mentioned there, you've touched on it there. EID uh, recording. You, um, you've been doing that for a long time, and you're a strong advocate of that. Um, it gives gives a wee bit of a background to that there. Yeah, well, we've always recorded the, the farm um, for years there. All yews were, were tagged, like we flag tagged that we would put in them. At lambing time, everything was recorded in a, in a black book, like, like most of people. Whenever the EDA came compulsory, we sort of looked at it and going, how can we make this work for for everybody? So I was strong out to get for it and um, really posted it on this last couple of years. So all lambs are um, tagged at birth, wet at birth, corresponded back to the yew and the ram and then wed throughout the year. Ideally, 40 days for the earlier lambing flocks, so we can try and pick our best yew lambs out of it. Eight weeks in, and then at your weaning then as well. And then the ewes are wed for the go tip, so I'll give you a weaning percentage from each ewe, etc. So you're trying to keep then your, your best yew lambs and your, and your best ewes as well. And I see here there's a, a very a new addition to the farm here. Um, new handling system, relatively new. So how's that work? Yeah, it's, it's working very well. It, it's probably four years we have it now, so like most Joes, they were sort of stubborn at the start there to get it, but now they've been about there a couple of years, it's so much harder, especially if you're maybe only one of us are at home during the day or vice versa. You usually run up themselves now, lambs run up themselves after the wind, and obviously you can just run through the foot bath there as well. You've, there's a turnover crate on it, dose you can weigh. It leaves it a lot harder for you and a lot less stressful in the sheep as well. Yep. Yeah, I'll say labour is a big issue. Um, just there, maybe a bit closer of the the reader or the wand. Um, or maybe just tell us how does that? Yeah, so I went with the wand rather than the PDA. Um, it's a bit more robust as well. Um, so that's recorded back in the a TGM software. You'll see there at the right hand side. Uh, it's just a little little digital uh, weighing scale. Um, I record that through. It is Bluetooth. We Bluetooth just doesn't work that well on it. But um, it would link to the wand and then. And 
it's linked to the computer. So any time you can check your lamb's health, that viability, more or less, you put you get out of it when you put into it. Yeah, and then you see here, Pog, for those that maybe have not seen it before, this is your um, a printout from the the program that you're using. Uh, maybe you just tell us what what we're looking at here. Yeah, so the software, as I said, there TGM software is locally here. Um, John or George McGarry there in Hillsborough. Um, more or less that there is just a a print off sheet of our WEN report from whenever we in the lambs there last week. So it's the same in order there from daily live week again. So you can put as much and take as much data off this as you want. So the likes from go from left to right would be what the lambs uh, tag number is. Um, is it one of triplet, double, single? Obviously, the sex with the breed is what I put on. So it's usually to the left, you'll see the likes of it's a taxel, cross off a gear, whatever. The dams breed. Um, what way, what weight it was at birth, the date it was weighing, which is the 20th there. Your, your weight, your your age, and then your daily weight gain. And then to the right hand side there, when they choose the feed group there, um, as you'll see there, it says creep, no creep, just to see this. The range there from um, on the uh, weaning there last week was. Uh, 0.29 daily every gain, so we're happy enough for that at the moment. And as you say, folks, that's that's the point of this uh, system. Uh, Pori can very quickly see the lambs that are performing, or more importantly, I would say, Pori, the yos that are performing. Yeah, um, at any time there, you can click in to the, the dam's tag, um, pick up whatever details you want off her, um, or maybe if you think that's a good yo lamb, I'd always look at the history of the, the yo. And if she's maybe in Jackson's for sore feet or something like that there, it's one area where it's kind of get rid of from the farm. Um, no matter how good a yule lamb was, it, it's not been kept for breeding. So it's just to try and get rid of that genetic history or um, to try and really get rid of the passengers that are on the farm. Good. Excellent. So then once the, you have all this data, and then the next bit, obviously, is the kill sheet that we we'll have here from, this uh, probably your last batch, Boric, or one before that? Yeah, no, that's the last batch there, yep. Yeah. Uh, last week, so it was. Um, it's more or less now to refer to the factories we're sort of we're shouting this last couple of years at them farmers are putting effort in to record from birth and you weren't getting in the last that the sort of the last bit of the jigsaw was falling through you weren't getting the tag for that so and we don't for cattle why can't it done for sheep so that's planted as well to the left you have your, your lamb's tag number um, cold weight and hot or hot weight and cold weight and then it is grade so makes life a whole lot easier whenever we're coming back there that's transferred back into the computer system maybe a lamb died really light or a, damn, a lamb died really heavy you, you know what lamb it was you're not scratching your head saying oh which one was it or so at least that and then transfers back to your your damn selection again how good the yo was how good the lamb kill it was so it's, it's more or less you're getting all the data rather than following the last hurdle yep excellent So that's uh, so basically then we've covered that wee bit there EAD and uh, the handling unit. Last couple of wee points in this one, Pori, the animal health plan. Um, all the farmers in the program have got that, um, and the soil sample as well. So maybe just we chat about the the health plan. That uh, what what issues would there be, or what what have you just discovered? Yeah, well, we've had a health plan in theory here in the past ten years. I think ten years ago was the first time Daddy done one. Um upgraded every few years so this year was due up an upgrade of another one so we'll use the as obviously the NI sheep program one's a bit more strenuous so sat down with the vet there in February he came out it was about four or five hours went through various details of the farm what areas to look at so really the take-home masters world we do have a problem with lameness on the farm we're rightly through sort of reducing that there now other areas raised we maybe increase the blood test and fecal egg counts and um, to see really what is on the farm do we need a mineral drench or not? And then the last antibiotic resistance. So try and cut down on antibiotics moving forward. Um, as really just what the factories and the co-ops or supermarkets are all asking for. Yeah, very much so. Um, within the programme, it's something we will be covering uh, later on is a OPA or Jackie's disease. Um, have you had a chance to have a look at that? It was to be carried out last year, um, Senator, um, but when it coincided, we had just put the ram into you, so didn't really want to disturb anything in the first couple of weeks. So it was penciled in to do this year, but obviously um, COVID has sort of messed it up at the moment. So really are pushing to try and get that done for more peace of mind and also you know, a bigger insight into the farm, because there's a few there we might maybe 
think that could be a, an issue on the farm. Yeah. No, very much agree with you, Carl, uh, Parag. It is, OPA is, is an issue. Um, it is something that we'll maybe chat about uh, later on, but it is something that we believe farmers should be uh, be aware of, and this is something to say we'll be doing on later on in, within the programme as well. And the final one there, uh, Parag, the soil sampling, um, what have you done there, or what would your results have been, or how often do you do it? Or uh, We always uh, used to soil sample throughout the years. Um, Daddy would always put a, a, a couple of fields of spring barley in, uh, and then rotated that as a, a breakup crop. Um, that sort of got out of rotation, uh, and we were in the countryside management, um, so it uh, sort of stuck to more than one fail that broke up a rotation. So all soil was sampled, although the farm sorry, was soil sampled on 2018 uh, through the band, uh, upper band scheme. So like everything, you, you don't know what you get to the results come back. So it was interesting reading. Obviously, need a lot more lime. Um, the average sitting at about 5.96 in your pH value. P was very low in around 1.1 to 1.2. And then the K was reasonably optimal at two to three so it was very good as i say that's what we're you know that leads on to what we're talking about this evening and getting the most out of grass is fundamental to know what your soil is like and, and the soil results are like so that's what i would emphasize and and, part of and the program farmers all have, have done that as well so um so the next bit part just you mentioned there you're in a countryside manager scheme obviously and then you've you've uh, joined the the follow-on, the EFS scheme there uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe you tell us a wee bit about that. Yeah, we joined the EFS scheme in 2018 and then the work was carried out in 2019. So it was a mixture of hedge laying um, with two protective fencing and then a uh, watercourse fencing out around dry and wet shucks. So it was about 180 metres of the hedge laying involved and then about 815 metres of the watercourse fencing. So that tied inside well with the the paddocks as well, meant you could close off fields better, you weren't worried about lambs or calves in the drain, stuff like that, so it's definitely a great addition to the farm. Good man, good man, yeah. Um, and just when you mentioned the paddocks there, Parag, um, obviously this last wee while, you've, you've, uh, all the programme farmers have you know uh, have plate meters through the programme and using the Agrinet uh, uh, package for recording. Tell us a wee bit about it and how you've been getting on with that. Yeah, um, so we all received a, a plate meter um, and to grass forward to the agronet, either recorded on just a piece of paper or I have it linked up to it on my phone. So the farms walk uh, once a week with, with the wee plate meters you can see there. That would give you your, your what you have on the grass there. There's 42 paddocks here have split in the farm. Um, hopefully with more generation of uh, swords and stuff like that there, we're going to split them down again. Um, sort of from left to right there, you'll see higher covers there that's what the the weaned lambs went into and um, the start of this week that was sort of after cut silage um the demand line the blue line there has dropped dramatically obviously because the lambs have come off the ewe so it probably doesn't coincide just what we have at the moment um, and then higher covers there the ewes that we need a bit more condition there cleaned out and then the higher ones there in the middle there's cows and calves grazing also and like you've been using this for a few weeks party um what have you found? Have you had a chance to maybe look at some of them higher fields and say, well, I could take that out, you know, for silage or is that? Yeah, well, the fields we cut silage, there actually was only one of them closed off for silage. Um, the other two was taken out um, because we didn't need them. They got ahead of us as, as grazing, just topped them up for we had a fertilizer. Even walking at the moment there, I've paddocks ahead of the cows, will probably will, they'll probably beat me, I'll take them out. And some of the ones that are ahead of the lambs, I'll take them out. It's so uh, I'm happy enough to take them out with the good leafy grass on, so hopefully it should be good good feeding in, in the back end. But you sort of know ahead yourself, but if once you get used to the agronet and sit down, it gives you a bit of sort of security to say, right, I, I can't afford to take these out, or you know, to bit, or maybe if it's sort of coming into a wet week or the grass will be the same, I'll, I'll maybe hold back or step them tighter. So it's just really a helping hand to reassure you. Yep. No, you're quite right. As I say, these are all management tools and... You know, there's nothing going to beat you out walking your walking your fields, looking at your stock, and you know making a judgment. But as you say, Parry, uh, gives you a wee bit more confidence to say, well, I'm, I'm making the right decision. So uh, good to hear. Um, so the next slide, folks, is just uh, we're talking about the fields. So just maybe show the actual farm as well, Parry. Maybe just talk us through what what we're seeing here. Yeah, we're quite lucky. Um, most seventy-five, eighty percent of our farm is is round home in one block. 
um, there's a few odd blocks of a couple of miles away. So most of us there, you'll see the, the farm more or less in the middle and everything is in Rennes there. So we're lucky to on the way, on the paddock side of it, most of our fields are in there, that four, four and a half, five, six acre field. So it's easier to split up as well. Very good. Yep. I say it is, it is a, it's, it's very advantageous to have that block right around you, as you said. So big folks, we're going to show here, we had got a wee bit of drone footage here to give you a wee bit of a, a better flavour of a Porig setup. Um, I say Porig, maybe just talk through here and I'll say there's a few minutes here, but we'll not play at all, but um, maybe you could just chat here. And if you want me to pause at any stage, Porig, just let me know. Yeah, well, you'll see more or less coming through the, the, the different colours there and uh, coming through. So them fields are all split in two. Um, there's six paddocks for that batch there. That have been the later bats lambed. They went around it and um, four to five days, depending on there. A bigger field uh, was split again, so it was. And um, both of them are, are next to our line to reseed. So there's actually dry yews in there at the minute trying to eat them down till hopefully reseed one of them in the autumn now and one of them in the springtime. So that batch of yews just went round that that uh, that block there, and there's six paddocks in it. They've left you back. There's you know. It's a very easy mood once you set up. The ewes get into the retune of it, the lambs get into the retune of it, and you're you're always accessing fresh grass as well. You know, Paddy, some people are going to ask, well, how do I, you know, it's all great in theory, paddocks, but what do you actually do? How do I set up? How do I allocate, you know, have a too much, have a too little? What did you do, or what would you say to anybody that's, you know, uh, that's, uh, say that that wasn't, you know, it wasn't working? More or less, play it by ear, give it a go. Like, as I said, them fields there were split again, so they were um, more or less because them fields are two acre fields or forty four acre fields split down the middle into two acre paddocks. So they were um, the beauty of the lattic fencing. If you think you've maybe split too much or not enough, it's only a matter of moving the fence or semi splitting it again to keep keep the lambs moving and keep the sheep moving on the fresh grass. So. It's more or less just trial and error to start off with, and um, once you get in the swing of it, you, you know exactly what if it's going to four days going to clean it out or three days. So it's really just trial and error. Yeah, yeah. It's a so as I say, it's nothing. Part of, you know, there's nothing to be scared of in terms of going and doing it. Basically, what you're saying. No, uh, I say we actually trial it with the cows first. Obviously, it's a wee bit easier. You've one run one or run a wire there. We've seen with the live weight gain increase there on the store cattle and the calves. Um, and then more or less trail it with the sheep. So as that video shows there, it's self-explanatory. You have uh, three strands of wire posts with six, seven yards apart, and it's tied on to the two fences. The fence that I said was one of the ones in the EFS, so that closed that field off a bit better as well. So there isn't really much rocket tent, is there? No, that's exactly so. Well, the one thing you hear some people say, oh, well, I can't do this because of water. Um, this is your water system, or one of them anyway. How's how's that worked? Or yeah, probably there would be one downfall of the farm. There isn't a great water throughout the farm, and um, maybe you've one truck stuck in the corner, sort of four or five fields. So that was one area last year. I thought oh, I have to keep trying to water. So look, it's not pretty by any means. More or less, it's just a bit of blue pipe along behind a hedge, along the top of thing. Just split it down the middle, and um, say the paddock's been taken out in that field there just for those cows in it. Um, or less runs to the top of the the water tank, and there's both your both your uh, paddocks fed. So it's you know it's cheap, relatively cheap too. What's a hundred meters of blue pipe, seventy five quid? You know it's even a water tub or an old bath. It doesn't have to be a, a fancy water truck. Yeah, no, so say it's, it's you know you do hear it uh, off different people, and I say it's it's not the best excuse. You know, so water can be got. Uh, just here, you're talking about the gate system here, uh, one paddock to the other. Swim here, paddock. Yeah, so that's the field split there um, on Monday there. Um, the lambs are currently lighter batch lambs at the moment. So it's more or less rather than so we used to drop it down and get run over it, but sort of encourage them maybe till run over the top of the fence or sometimes. So it's just an ordinary sheep hurdle, um, two bits of stick. So that's the way we're running them through the paddocks at the moment there to get them used to it uh, as well. Good, man. Well, you mentioned me the other day about, you know, lambs running ahead and uh, you sent this photograph in. Maybe you tell us a wee bit about it. Yeah, same thing again, Sam. There's your additional water truck put in it and uh, a couple of bits of stick made things. So I suppose I had to give you a bit of credit here, this one here. Um, it was your uh, notion, but we reinvented it. So it says there it's a silage feeder turned upside down. 
and click them with two sheep hurdles there to use as a gate as well but to encourage the lambs to creep ahead it's probably one area I would like to maybe push at again next year encourage it a bit more so maybe your ewes are left I mean an extra day to clean out your paddock a bit more when your lambs are getting your better grass they're increasing your life weight gain as well so it's all down to just actually extra, extra methods and it doesn't have to be a fancy creep gate there your hopefully your ring feeder shouldn't be huge this time of year so you may as well put them some use Good man, good man. Well, good to see you. Thanks for that. Um, folks, we're nearly uh, finished the wee bits here, but just a, a couple of wee bits, maybe, Parag, from yourself. Where do you see yourself going? Where do you see some things we chat about here, but maybe you just go through where things you've learned or what you want to do better or maybe change? or. Um, well, I say we're still learners in this paddock system. It's still only really our second year of more of a permanent setup, but definitely looking at them fields we talked about over over the out farm maybe as we reseed them maybe looking at putting more permanent uh setup into that there so we can semi divide them again mm-hmm. maybe look at the option of mains electric fence because everything's quite close to home there um but obviously if you're out working you don't have to worry about the body letting you down or they make it a, a better shock off of the mains like the fence or the eda still there's a world of information to use out of that yet i mean, we really need to sit down and push on at it and see how well we can get the results back out of it and if it, it'll work for itself once you put in with what 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 data you want to use on it the maternal line is probably one of the biggest things as well to, to close the flock down again so when i uh, purchased the bell clear last year so maybe looking at different breeds in new zealand suffolk aberfield something like that there to run a 50 50 um maternal and term terminal sort of thing lamin outdoors is probably a questionable one if we can get a, a batch that maybe we can lamb outdoors, we'll have to sp- spend the same capital on housing. And um, probably the most important one to, to me and data here would be the, the sward rejuvenation. It, it says they're 75%. Really are going pushing for 100% to get the farm reseeded in your, in, within the five years and really get the land and the, the, the grass to, to perform for, for the work we're putting in as well. Good man. No, very, very commendable, very commendable. Well, folks, we'll be remiss here without talking about talking about paddocks all evening. And Parag, as I'm sure he's come across as a, a great advocate for it. Um, he is developing it, obviously. But just a wee slide here before we, before we really wrap up here on actually the pros and cons of paddocks. Um, and I think you can see right away there's more pros than there is cons. Um, things we've probably chat about this evening. You know, you have more grass. It's better grass. Um, as a result of which you can stock a higher stocking rate. Um, you can extend the growing season. And I think, Parig, as we've mentioned there, you'll be able to cut out deals and stuff like that there uh, using the paddock system. Um, the cons, obviously, Parig, not really a big con. Any of the things there were shown? The cost? The... Your, your initial cost of your fence and post and water, you know, but it's a small cost too. You know, obviously, if you're down to more permanent, uh, set up it would be a, a lot higher cost just more or less the one thing i would say that if we sort of messed about it last year going through different things nearly have a paddock sitting ready ahead of yourself so especially if people are out working you don't have to try and you know, set and run out lanes and cross the field and stuff like that there so it's just a matter of opening the gate in the way in and maybe a couple of days time set your next paddock up so it's just really getting ahead of yourself is probably the most easiest way and because if you got behind it it sort of would turn you off it but you know, just keep an extra paddock ahead of yourself and Makes life easier for yourself. Yep, good man. Um, it says quieter, more manageable stock. <laughs> Yo's, how the how are they, are there or what have you found? Um, I uh, thankfully our yo's aren't too bad. You always get the one that wants to go that road. But yeah, at, same as cows and calves, no matter what, or dry stock. Once they know they're ready to move, you are not have to chase them to the field. Like once you the gate open, they're nearly beating you with half it. So. It's easier for yourself, easier for them, and then we try to nearly coincide, maybe a dosing or a weighing or something like that there, with nearly on the last day of the paddock, so they're easier moved as well, and don't have to run about it often. Good ball, good ball. Right, Park, thank you very much. Um, just the final wee slide here before we hand over to Graham, and I say, with all these things, folks, I just want to leave you with a few take-home messages. I think Parik has conveyed this far better than any, any of us could do. Um, as you all know, grass grows, grass grows differently over the year, up and down. Um, but I think Parik would be very much an advocate of basically 
you want to graze the best grass you can. The leafiest grass is going to turn into cheap meat or cheap milk or whatever it is you have. Um, regularly assess your grass. I think, Parag, you go every week to measure yours, I think you've said. Um, and that has, has enabled Parag to look and see, well, look, there's a field I can maybe take out or I haven't as much as I thought, so it can maybe slow up um, if the uh, situation and the, and the weather dictates otherwise. But I think the last point, Parag, I'll maybe leave it to you. What do you think? It's there in bold, like it, it's definitely, it, give it a go. Even if you start off with a rotation, just to get the sheep moving, cattle, whatever we have there, the fresh grass, it, if you even say, right, next two months, I'm going to move ahead, it pays for itself in dividend. You're going to see the lambs increasing, the, the ground's getting a rest, it's bouncing back out of the ground, you have less fertilizer to use. It's just give it a go would be the, the take home message for me. It, it doesn't take a big pile to, to set it up, but sometimes it might work for early, but if you give it a go and give it a chance, you'll not turn back on it. Definitely not. Good man, Pori. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, folks, that's our bit uh, for now. I'll say thank you very much for listening. And I'm just going to hand over to Graham again. And I'll say if you have any questions, uh, please do so. So over to you, Graham. Okay, Senan, uh, thank you very much. Senan, first of all, thanks very much to yourself for providing an excellent overview of the programme. And Porek, also thanks to you for an excellent overview of your sheep enterprise and also for highlighting them key tech home messages, which are vital, vitally important going forward. As you, as you have both been presenting, uh, I have been inundated with questions here coming through to me, and I just want to uh, go through a, a number of them. Uh, sadly, we haven't time to answer them all. Quite, there's a few of them coming through here in relation to land price and future market outlooks. We'll leave them to next week because it will be more relevant uh, in relation to next week's event. So, Parik, I'm going to give you a, a break for a minute or two. I'm going to start off here with Senan, uh, a question that's come through. Senan, you have now been working uh, with the 10 participant farmers over the past year. At this stage, are you now starting to see change across all the farms? The answer is yes. Um... And the biggest change that I've seen is a question I've asked the farmers at the very start of the programme. And they probably think, oh, here he's at it again. What I've found is that get the farmers to answer the question, why? And that's what I would challenge any farm to do. Why am I doing this? And the programme farmers are getting into that way of thinking, you know, why am I spreading this fertiliser? Why am I uh, cutting my grass at this time of the year? Uh, why am I dosing my lambs every six weeks? You know, if you can answer that question and you're happy with that answer, that's fine. But I would say, you know, farmers now are getting into the, the things that they've normally done. And we encourage all farmers to do this. Please question what you're doing. And if you're saying, well, because I've always done it, you know, that doesn't really cut it. You know, you need to be 100 percent sure that what you're doing is, is the right thing to do. And I say if you're sowing the same fertilizer because I've always sown it, get a soil test done, you know, those type of things. So that's why. Ask yourself why would be the biggest thing. Uh, thank you very much, Senan. Uh, Senan, uh, no, thank you. Sorry, Darren, I'm going to move on to yourself. You've had a tandy all night here. Yeah. So uh, I think it's important to give you a turtle. Uh, in relation to the Better Farm Sheep Programme, uh, the Southern Programme, uh, what were the three main changes uh, or improvements that the particip participating farms uh, have made since they joined the programme? Yeah, so I suppose uh, it, it's it's probably heartening to hear, Graham, that Parik has touched on a lot of them so far. Like mm -hmm. one of the big things in any system is trying to, I suppose, maybe increase output because you're going to farm is going to have a certain amount of variable costs, fixed costs, and the way of, at the end of the day, we're all trying to make more money and it's trying to increase that the value of output, but also increase the volume. And like it's very easy for Sin and myself or or, or yourself to go onto a farm and tell them, look at you need to increase output. That can be done by, as Parik says, going to say maybe a high prolificity genetics. Uh, the other big one is increased stocking rate. But what you have to find is the happy balance. And I think there's uh, a lot of the farmers, this even someone who would have pushed the system to see where it can go to, uh, and then maybe came back even in cases 5% to just maybe get to where the farm is, is maybe able to operate, that it isn't putting too much pressure. And, the farm will only, I suppose, find that in time. And it's, it, it's like as what Paul said there is, there's no point us planning a system for him that he's lambing down at a scanning rate of 2.2 or 2.3 lambs per year if he can't get out to work in the morning. 
Uh, so it's trying to find that happy balance, I think. The next one is, is that I see is, look, grassland management has the biggest influence of Everton sort of. And like we often get, say, hung up on some of the some of the systems on that we have to have 100 percent of the farm reseeded from the beginning. We need to be going in with the plough. We need to say do everything. I think that a, a lot of the farms have learned from this. They increase the grass growth as they're increasing stocking rate and as they have, say, maybe money to spend it on. Because uh, you can, I suppose, maybe put all the new reseeding in place. But if you don't have stock to utilize it, and Park's approach is dead right in that, and that he's increasing paddocks that he goes, he's increasing, uh, say, the percentage of receding he's doing. Uh, and that is a game uh, a game changer, really. And the last one, I think that uh, is becoming more and more apparent is, is around the issue of health. And it's not just the normal things like we talk about, like, say, lameness or liver fluke or that. This, we have real challenges like, like OPA that we're trying to tackle and maybe provide lessons to, to other farmers through the program, or even simple things like that, I think is going to become a big issue. And it's something that we look at with the farmers as well is the whole issue of antimintic resistance. And it's the least attractive subject that we'll ever talk about, but it's one that could have the greatest long term benefit if we're using doses and we're finding there's resistance to white, yellow, and uh, key or trenches. So I think they're probably the three main ones, Graham. Uh, and in every farm, I suppose the big thing that, I've, that a lot of farmers have taken is to to work a system and don't be afraid to change that you can put down stuff on paper but to continually uh, challenge yourself and change the program to see where you can make more money at the end of the day that's what we're all here for yeah yep, certainly darren thank you very much and uh, myself and sen and Anne, the majority of farmers have visited some of those farms and change is one word that definitely uh, was mentioned throughout the visit and, it, and it's evident to see that the change has certainly taken place. Uh, another question, Porek, I'll maybe switch over to you here now. Uh, there's a whole range of questions come through, Porek, so we could be here all night at this uh, rate of going. Uh, you're now seeing the benefits of uh, paddock management, paddock systems, and I know you did touch on it. Uh, do you now feel you can increase numbers and, and what would you be thinking ever of increasing the yield numbers and, and cutting out the cows or, or, or what's your thoughts uh, going forward? Um, well, the suck ran is probably a new enterprise for us. So around here, I think they're going hand in hand. So the suckers probably would stay in round and the sheep would increase. But I say it, w it will be the, the final part of the jigsaw. Like the sward, rejuvenation, the paddocks, water, the proliferacy. That's all sort of paramount at the moment, and then increase until it. So, around that 250, 300, hopefully, that we, we can eventually get to five, six years. Yep, no, excellent. Uh, just, Porik, you talked a wee bit about uh, forward rejuvenation and, and reseeding. Have you ever or thought of it introducing herbal mixes? Yeah, um, actually, the minute, Graham, we're doing a reseed here. Um, so, that's going to be, we're going to try, try it on a couple of smaller fields here, um, literally very close to the home. See what that's like, and then then bigger fields will will push it on it. And I've been talking to it, and guys that have used it have had great success with. It. So it could be in my plan and Daddy's plan in around that thirty to forty percent of the farm to have a herbal mix in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, and and there's a lot of potential there for for these mixes going forward. Uh, for I'm, I'm moving on here. Senan, I'll maybe ask you a question. Let's just come in here. You're working with, the, with these participants every day. What do you see uh, as one of the biggest challenges facing the Northern Ireland sheep industry at present? Whew, that's a big question. Um, well, <laughs> well, obviously, outside of costs, prices, all that thing, um, labour, honestly, labour. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can suggest and Darren can write and we can see things that more efficiencies, yes, but labour is one of the issues that I'm coming across on all the farms. I say Parig has demonstrated there this evening with the, the handling unit that he has to make things easier. Um, I would be encouraging and I have been encouraging the farmers in the programme to, you know, farm out some of that work, you know, and I'm glad to see some of them have, you know, done simple things like got a contractor in to spread fertiliser, the first cut or even the sage or some of the, the, the grazing ground even. Um, other things like bringing in contractors to do fencing and stuff, you know. You know, one farmer can't do everything and labour across all enterprises um, is becoming a bigger, bigger issue. And, you know, that's all I would say to farmers is, you know, look for help. Don't don't try to do everything, you know. Yep. Very, very good, Simon. 
Uh, Porik, a few more production type questions here. Uh, do you creep feed any lambs? Sort of age-old question over here, Graham. Um, for years we've tried it and haven't tried it. So this year with the sort of more in the software, the very first batch uh, got some creep and the rest of the batches didn't. To see what really the live weight gain was working, um, killer percentage of stuff I got there. So the first batch did get a bit of creep. There's nothing being fed here at the moment. I have to wean that they've good enough grass to go on to and hopefully so. Ideally, we wouldn't want to creep anything, um, but we'll probably try it for the next year again to see really to get that final answer. The kill out percentages, obviously, on the lambs that were crept fed were a lot higher, meaning we could move them at, at lighter weights to hopefully maybe quicker get that sort of higher price. Um, but they weren't fed heavy, like I averaged it out there, they'd maybe get three pounds um, per head over that sort of that period they were fed. So 55% of that batch is away so far. So I probably paid for self in that area, but I wouldn't be an advocate for creep feeding every lamb. No, definitely not. Okay, uh, that's that's fine. Porik. Another practical type of question in relation to the electric fencing. How do you work with lambs who are defiant uh, and just continue to go on through? How do you deal with them, or uh, do they all eventually learn to stay on the right side of the fence? It's not usually the lambs we have problem with. Um, if the lambs do go through the fence, I'm not really that worried. They're creeping ahead. Mm. It's the more defiant yos, um, they usually get a wee nick in the ear on next year the lot about. So it's really the way it works. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, just a couple of questions here, Parik, again uh, on the breeding. What made you move away from the Charlie and, and towards uh, the Beltex, your old lambs? That's um, a big decision. We, cause to make that tip work as well, he would get a selection of sort of the le least prolific gules as well to, to keep him keep him working throughout the year. Uh, I just wasn't 100% uh, sold on him. Um, just with that later lambing, maybe just had a, a couple of days inside where the belt hacks a bit more, a bit more upkeep, sort of living about it, but. It would nothing stop us come back into the future, maybe with Shari Ram for more terminal sire onto the the bigger use and uh, whenever we have the maternal side uh, uh sort of nailed down more. But it was just the way it was set up with the month of the U Lamb, the suit of the belt hacks that slightly finer, slightly smaller and it'd be a bit more sort of get up and go on them. Yeah, well no definitely. And again as we talked about earlier, it has all has changed. So uh Porik, another question just in relation to your paddocks. How many yules would you have in your two acre paddocks? Uh and how long do they stay? I think you did say four days, but how many ewes at a time would you have? Uh, and then, then batches there, one batch is about 80 ewes in it, and that batch is about 100 ewes in it. So ideally, I say we're still talking about the idea as well, it's four to five days. I'd like to get that down to three day. Um, so more sort of maybe split them into an a batch or mob them again. The mob, mob, mob them up sort of into higher batches work a lot better as well. Um, so maybe increase them to maybe 120, 130. I don't really look at use per hectare. It's more what I can get them cleaned out and in and out in, in, in two, three, four days, whatever for paddock it needs, really. Okay. Uh, Porik, we're now approaching the time of year when you're starting to consider purchasing rams and placements. And, uh, do you ever consider purchasing or do you, do you buy performance recorded rams? What's your thoughts on that? Yes. A big issue would be, um, I think our... No dig at sort of breeders or hounds be tied slightly up here. And um, you look across the water into the south, you sheep Ireland. It's a it's a lot more open. You have your EBVs up here. We're still adequate for it. We still look at the best looking one, and that's the one you come home with. But it'd be a adequate. Most of the farmers in this group here would be pushing towards. Now part of the jigsaw as well. You, you take it from pig men and dairy men. They wouldn't touch a a bull or a boar with, without having figures behind it so mm -hmm. obviously man, it can't be any different it, it's definitely an area we have to push and be pushed a bit harder to shout to say demand these figures more yeah and darren i'll maybe bring you in there uh, for your thoughts on that Lee. certainly is this the way we all should be heading what, what's your opinion yeah that? i suppose graham look at it's it's a it's a challenge for sectors right across i suppose maybe all sheep farm and and uh Paul mentioned there that maybe Sheep Ireland have maybe a start uh, and are maybe down the road a bit. And look at a lot of that came from 
a government and as part of agriculture initiative a few years ago to incentivize farmers to go out and purchase them rams. Unfortunately, like say as, as commercial farmers, we do have to blame ourselves a bit in this. Uh, pedigree farmers will produce animals that are selling best in the ring. And as Paul says, it's, it's at the moment, it's looks. And it's the same way with, say, the feeding side of things is, uh, as commercial farmers, we need to drive change. We need to be looking for the rams that have the figures. We need to be looking for rams that are less fed and, say, less pampered. Uh, and also, I think, look, I know the cafe are, are, are pushing it, but we, you do need help, I think, at a government level as well to, to try and get as ma many of these initiatives into play and try to, to push them. Like, the, I suppose maybe there's always going to be challenges, particularly on the hillside of things. But within the farm gate, I think we can do a lot. And Park has shown this evening, like, I suppose there's no point even going out and buying a recorded ram if you don't have, I suppose, to get the maximum value out of it. There's, you buy them and it's it's great but you need to put in the, i suppose maybe the work the park has done in following progeny following all that too and like in any of the work to the central progeny test to say the mad flocks to any of the flocks even on tullamore farm it, you are starting yeah. to see that the figures do make sense and you'll always get an argument of i bought a five star ram and genie he down to a three star now but you don't hear as many stories as a two star going up to a five star. And as an industry, is we need to get get behind it more, record more information, and we will get the benefit out of it. Yeah, no, certainly, and I agree, Darren. Uh, it's something that uh, we all need to get behind. Uh, and programs like this certainly certainly help and provide the evidence that it does. But Darren, or, or sorry, Parik, a question: We're at a changeable time of year with weather. In relation to sheep dipping, do you dip on farm, or or what? What method do you use for? Uh, uh, we haven't dipped on farm, Graham, probably this last 10 or 12 years. We'll have yeah. a, a dipper and all on farm. It needs a bit of work done. It's in the wee out farm there. We've seen the drone. So it needs a bit of work done with and the crush and stuff I got there. So labour was a big issue as well. But there's not as many as about. So we went back just to our ordinary pour on and spray is what we use throughout the year. But moving forward, probably the dipping will, will go back into the system. But you're probably looking at more mobile dippers and Stuff like that there moving forward to really get across what the product should be doing. Yep, uh, no, certainly. And I tell you, it's an industry challenge up here due to the uh, resistance to scab of a lot, a lot of the poor on star. And I know uh, you have been, you had an article recently published there in relation to mobile plunge dipping systems. Can you give us a, a very brief insight into, into these type of systems and, and what yeah, you're training from them? It's funny you should say it, Graham, because I was actually looking at a photo and I'm not sure whether it's in the paper today or not of, uh, of a young uh, sheep farmer in Derry that has now got a, a plunge dipping system in. Uh, and I think they are becoming, say, the, the more of the norm. There's, like, uh, And I suppose maybe to clarify first here, that it's not the mobile shower units that we're talking about. There's a lot of mobile shower units on farms and they've seen in the UK that uh, overuse of these is leading to resistance. Overuse of, uh, say, it's not just these. Overuse of injectables. Overuse of maybe poor ones. But after mobile dipping units simply work as it's like bringing a dipping tub onto your farm. But the reason why they've taken off so well in the South game that we now have, I think, is this at the last count is ten or eleven, uh, uh, say contractors offering the services. It's going back to the point that Sinan made, is that you're essentially bringing on more labour. I, I was talking to one of them there, Kevin Sheridan, a few weeks ago, and I was asking him, how is it going? And I said, have you seen any trends? And he said, he said, a lot of farms are going on to. He said, maybe have a dipping unit. And I say to them, where will I put up? And they say, pull in beside a dipping unit. He said, I'm scratching my head wondering, why am I here? And he said, you look at the age profile of some of the farmers, and also it's 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 an extra pair of hands. They can keep the sheep fed up to me, he said. And I'm doing a service for them. And I think, look, it's, we have to get back to that. There's, like At the moment, uh, we do need to be very clear as well is that there's no licensed dipping product that can be used to a shower or to a jetter at the moment. Uh, we do need to get better with our information say as of what's available or what should be used in, in the likes of injectables. But I do think this long term, we need to get back to more dipping. And to me, the way to get back to that is 
uh, mobile plunge different contractors, not just anybody, ones that are willing to do it right, willing to have the sheep in there for 60 seconds, keep the dip topped up. And for any one of them fellas, there'll be plenty of work, I think, in the future. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, Darren. And for anybody who wants to read that article, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, you can, uh, you can it's available online to, to read. Folks, uh, I'm conscious we're, we're slightly over time here. Uh, there's still questions coming in. I think we've got a, a number of them. Again, there are a lot of them are in relation to land price and marketing going forward. So that will be, I'm not going to touch on them tonight. That'll be covered uh, next week. But just to conclude everything, uh, I hope you find this event useful. Certainly I have. Uh, and I hope you've gained uh, relevant tips to take home into your own uh, sheep enterprises. If you are a BDG member and you have further questions in, into, in relation to grassland management or introducing paddock systems, certainly contact your local CAFRI advisor. Uh, if you have any questions in relation to the programme, please contact either Senan, Darn, or myself, uh, and we'll certainly uh, try and, and help you. Please note, uh, event two will take place next Thursday night at the same time at 7.30. The focus on this event will be selecting lambs for slaughter. Uh, and again, as Senan mentioned earlier on, the host farmer will be Mark Davison from uh, Dungannon. Kenny Linton from Dumbia and Terry White from the LMC uh, will provide us uh, with useful video clips on how to select lambs for slaughter, things you should be looking at and, and considering. And the event will then conclude with a brief presentation from Phil and O'Neill uh, in relation uh, to future market outlooks for, for the autumn time going uh, and further on. After that event, we hope to come back again in early August uh, with a series of other events in relation to sheep health, uh, preparing for the top of the season, etc. So please certainly uh, keep in, we'll keep in touch with you because uh, we have, we will be doing more of these events. And again, if you have any events you want us to consider, please email ideas through to me because I'm certainly open to ideas. Uh, we would ask you that you do that. So folks, I'm not going to hold you back any longer. Finally, uh, we have developed a survey, as I mentioned earlier on. Once I finish, uh, the survey should appear on screen. So just wait a few seconds for it to appear. And be honest, complete it, and uh, we, we, we do look at them and we do take some of your points into consideration. So it will appear automatically. So again, I want to thank everybody tonight for participating. Uh, Mark will be in the hot seat next week, uh, and Darn and Senan will also uh, be back. We'll all be back again. And uh, same time next week, we will send out reminders, but uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. So thank you very much in the meantime. Thank you.